All right, this video is covering section 1.3, which is dealing with complex numbers. So before we even start talking about complex numbers, let's show a situation in which we need complex numbers. So if I ask you to solve the following simple equation, um, x squared is equal to negative 1, well, you might think, well, we could take the square root of both sides. And so the square root of x squared, and then we take the square root of negative 1. So we take the square root of both sides. The left side, of course, is just going to be x, but the right-hand side, actually, we're taking the square root of both sides, so technically I should be thinking about plus or minus, so two possible answers. But here's the dilemma, is I'm taking the square root of negative 1. So I'm looking for something that, when I multiply by itself, gives me um, negative 1. So if I said, oh, 1 times 1 is 1, but it, of course it's not negative 1. And negative 1 times negative 1 is not negative 1, it's positive 1. So there is no number in our real number system that we um, have been dealing with so far that um, that is the solution to this. Up to this point, we would say, oh, this is impossible. There's no real solution. Okay. Um, well, we came up with, I don't know, 400 years ago, uh, we came up with this idea of using i to represent the square root of negative 1 so that we could continue with the problem and, uh, and work with the solution a little bit further. So um, we would say that the, the answer to this, so it's plus or minus, and then the square root of negative 1 is just i. So we typically write it sort of as a scripted i. Um, as opposed, you know, sometimes we'll just write it as I, but when I write it, I'll make it like a little bit cursive, okay? So that is sometimes referred to as the um, imaginary number, imaginary number or the imaginary unit, and it's just I. So I is equal to the square root of negative 1. Typically what we do is we take that negative out from underneath the radical and we turn it into an I, all right? So... Um, if I have i to the 1, that's just i. If I have i squared, so if I take, um, it, I mean, it makes sense, if I take a square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, kind of makes sense that that should be equal to negative 1, right? So I take an i out and an i out, an i times an i, or i squared, is negative 1. And then if I take that and multiply it by another i, i cubed, that's negative 1 times i, or just negative i. And then if I um, take i to the fourth power, that's just i squared squared. So it's negative 1 squared, which is now going back to positive 1. Okay, so think about what i to the fifth and i to the sixth would be. So think about that. That's i to the fourth, which is just 1, times another i, so this is really just i. i to the fifth is equal to just i to the 1. And i to the sixth, I multiply i by another i, that's i squared, and so that's just going to be negative 1. And this cycle continues. You can see it's starting over again, right? i to the 1 i to the 5, i to the 2nd, i to the 6th. And that's this dot, dot, dot just means this continues. Every fourth um, exponent, um, the cycle continues. Okay, so if I wanted to know what i to the ninth was, I could think of that as i to the 8 times i. And i to the 8 is a multiple of 4. So this is really just equal to i, because i to the 8th is, again, the exponent is multiple 4. That's just going to be positive 1, so positive 1 times i, or just i. All right, now 243. Well, what do we got to do? We got to figure out where 243 is in this cycle of 4. So really, what we want to do is we want to divide 243 by 4. All right, so that ends up being 60 with a remainder of 3. So that means that this whole thing is just equal to 
i to the third, the remainder, tells us where we are in the cycle. So if I, if you think about it, one, if I divide one by four, it's a zero with a remainder of one, remainder of two, remainder of three, and then you might say, oh, a remainder of four, no, it'd be a, a zero remainder, right? Four divided by four, it goes evenly with a remainder of zero. So if the remainder is zero, the answer will just be equal to i to the four or one. Um, if, if the remainder is three, it's i, i cubed, which is negative one. So we never, we never leave our answer as i cubed or i squared or i to any power other than one. Um, this is negative i. Okay. So when we simplify um, complex numbers that are raised to powers, we don't want to leave anything in any power other than one. So in other words, we could write i, i to the one, negative one. We can have negative i, again, to the one, or we can have plus one. Those are always, those four answers are what everything simplifies to. All right, what about i to the negative five? Well, this one is a little tricky. What you have to first do is say, that's the same as one over i to the five. Okay, and now you might say, oh, um, this is like having a radical in the denominator. Um, I, if you wanted to, I could change this into i to the one, which is what i to the five is, or I can just multiply this by, get this up to the next multiple of four. So I can multiply by th this by i to the third over itself, i to the third over i to the third, and that gives me i to the third over i to the eight, but i to the eight, that's just going to be one. So this is i to the third, but again, we don't want to leave that as an answer. i to the third is negative i. Um, negative. Negative i. Okay? So what you really want to do is divide each, normally, if it's an exponent, we're going to divide by four, and we don't really care how many times it goes into it. All we really care about is the remainder, all right? And that remainder tells us the exponent on the i. So 2i to the 243 is equal to i to the third, which is just negative i. Does that make sense? Um, and then when they're negative exponents, well, we just take it downstairs. We could simplify this if we wanted, or in this case, I just multiplied by i cubed over i cubed. Um, that gives me, um, we, I want a power of four here, okay? All right, um, complex numbers. We sometimes talk about imaginary numbers and complex numbers. We use those terms interchangeably, although technically they're a little bit different. So a complex number has a real component and an imaginary component. So a plus um, b to the uh, b times i or bi. And so this is the imaginary part. This is the real part. All right, two complex numbers are said to be equal if their real components are the same and if their imaginary components are the same. So in other words, um, a plus bi is equal to c plus di if, if and only if, a is equal to c, so the real components are equal, a must equal c, and b must equal d. All right, so if they are equal, I know those components are the same. If I know these components are the same, then I can say they're equal. All right, complex number. So for a complex number, um, a plus bi. If b is zero, so if the coefficient in front of that i is zero, then that kind of goes away. So we have a plus zero i, or just a, which is what we call just purely real. So if you think about it, this is a complex number. A subset of complex numbers is essentially every number that you've thought of in your life so far. So every number that you think of is real, and we think of that as sort of a subset you know, so you've been dealing with complex numbers your whole life. It's just that your zero, your your B has always been zero with all the numbers you've been dealing with. Okay, so um, the real numbers are really a subset of the complex numbers. So unbeknownst to you, you've been using complex numbers your whole life. All right, that's just how we sort of set up the complex number system. If 
the a part is zero. So if a is zero, and then we just have b i, then we call that a purely imaginary. Okay, so no real part, real no no real component to it. All right, let's try uh, simplifying some complex numbers. So we have, um, and again, so you know, complex uh, expressions, I guess. Um, Again, we're going to use the term complex and imaginary sort of interchangeably. Um, okay, so the, simplify the square root of negative 81. All right, so the first thing we want to do is take this negative out. So we could write this as i times the square root of 81. And the square root of 81, of course, is 9. So you might think of this as not i9, but... We want to think, even though i is sort of a complex number, um, we really want to write that as 9i instead of i9. So like you wouldn't say x times 2, we'd say 2x. So we won't say i times 9, we'll say 9i. Okay, all right, next one. So again, we just want to pull that i out. So i times the square root of 55 and there are no perfect square factors in, in, of 55, so it's just i times the square root of 55. Now notice, here we're putting the i first. We don't want, in this case, to say square root of 55. We never really want to put things under behind the radical. So if we did that, that would sort of seem like we should do that because we're doing 9i. Why wouldn't we do square root of 55i? Um, because then it looks a little confusing because we're not sure is that I underneath the radical, which we're not going to see in this class, but it's a little bit ambiguous. So we never put things under the, behind the radical. So if I have two square roots of two, for example, I'm not going to write that as the square root of two and then put a two back there, right? Because then is that square root of 22 or is that, you know, you're not sure. So we'll always put those that thing in front. And so the same thing with this. So we don't write it like this. We'll write it as i times the square root of 5. Now, if it was 5 times the square root, uh, it was, it, sorry, if it was 5 times i, we would write that as 5i, not i5. But with a radical, we'll try to put the things in front of the radical. That way it's less confusing. Okay, so we have a negative out in front, and we have a negative in here. Those do not cancel. This negative is not a real negative. It is no, it's not part of the real number system. So the negative here does not work like this negative. So these negatives do not cancel. A negative times a negative is a positive. That doesn't work here because that's a real negative. That's an imaginary number, right? That is not a negative like we're used to. So we're going to bring in that negative out. So we have negative i square root of 20, and then we'll just simplify square root of 20 like we normally would, bring a 4 out, so we get negative 2i square root of 5. So you can see kind of the order that we put things in. Of course, the negative is going to be out first, 2i, and then the square root goes last. Okay, um, this one here. Now be careful. We cannot say, oh, a negative times a negative is a positive, and have those cancel out. It doesn't work that way. These are not real negatives. They're negatives under a radical. So to be safe, what I would say is make this i square root of 21 times i square root of 21. And so that's going to be what? i squared, i times i is i squared, times the square root of 21 times the square root of 21 is just 21, and i squared is equal to negative 1, so this is really just equal to negative 21, which kind of makes sense because you have something under the radical times that same thing under a radical, that's going to be one whole thing. So in other words, if I have square root of 5 times the square root of 5, we, won't, we aren't going to say, oh, that's the square root of 25. We'll just say that is equal to 5. So it kind of makes sense that we have something under the radical, the same thing under the radical. Um, it should just be negative 21. And it kind of works that same way. All right, so try E. We're going to have an I square root of 5 times another I 
and then there's a square root of five in here. So we want to think, of, even if we don't write it, we want to think of this as a five times a six. Rather than multiplying all this together, which we could do, um, you can see like, oh, I have a five of a five. That's going to give me a five out in front. So square root of five, a square root of five, that's going to leave me a five out in front. And I squared and square root of six left. Um, and the I squared, of course, is negative one. So this will be negative five square root of six. So like, I probably wouldn't write this part, but think it in my head, but whatever it takes to get the right answer is good. All right, next one. <clears throat> so we can certainly take an I out in front, square root of six over um, square root of 21. Now, I can sort of reduce this fraction. Um, instead of multiplying top and bottom by square root of 21, uh, might be nicer to cancel a three out of here, make that a two, cancel a three out of here, make this a seven. And then, um, oh, actually, I think, I think um, there's a right, there's a typo in this. Yeah, there's, I'm missing a three. For some reason, when I printed this out, the three didn't show up again. You know, it happens from time to time. All right, so this is negative 63 over 21. Let me change this. Some reason when I print out these PDFs, certain things disappear. So that three disappeared there. Okay, so this is negative um, six, square root of negative 63 over square root of 21. So first, let's bring the I out, right? Bring that negative out in front. That's an I. And then I can think about this, but let's just rewrite it. 63 over square root of 21. Those are going to reduce, right? And so that's just going to be I times the square root of three. And again, we put the I out in front, the square root of three behind. Okay, makes sense? All right, um, next thing, adding and subtracting complex numbers. So when we add two complex numbers, we simply, or whether we just subtract them, we're going to add or subtract the real parts and the complex parts. <clears throat> so the four minus the two, that's just gonna be a two. And the negative 5i plus 3i, that's just going to be negative 2i. It's really that simple. You add or subtract the real parts and add and subtract the complex parts. All right, so let's try this one. The real parts, that's going to be negative 12. And then we have a negative i, and this is going to be a positive 3i, so plus 2i. Okay. Notice I didn't factor these things out. We're trying to simplify it so we wouldn't factor a two out unless it was part of a fraction and we wanted to cancel something. All right, next one, multiplying complex numbers. So multiplying complex numbers, you can see they sort of look like a binomial times a binomial, and that's what you have to do. You have to FOIL these. So the five times the two, that's 10. Five times negative seven I, that's negative 35 I. Um, that's plus 6i in the middle, the inside. And then we have um, 3i minus a 7i, that's a minus 21i squared. Now the i squared is going to change the sign, so when you get a, do this enough, you'll know like, oh, I can just make that positive 21. All right, so that positive 21 um, and that 10, that's going to give me 31. And then we want to subtract these and get negative 29i. All right, one's, one's positive, one's negative, so we subtract those. Okay, um, here, this is going to act a lot like um, a, a uh, perfect square trinomial. So perfect square trinomials, when I foil this, I get three terms, right? I get the first thing squared. I get twice the product, so that should be negative 24 I, and then I get uh, the second thing squared. So that's going to be plus 16i squared. Now the 16i squared is going to change sign. That's going to be negative 16. When I add 9 to it, I get negative 7 minus 24i. So it, remember, this looks like a binomial, but it's a complex number. 
And so when I multiply a complex number times a complex number, it makes sense that I should just get a complex number. So I should have two terms when I'm done, right? One, some of these terms have i's in them. Some of them don't have i's because i squared becomes negative one. So it makes sense if you think about it. A complex number times a complex number should just be a complex number. And so that's what we get. So even though we have three terms up here, they're going to combine into two terms, a real component and an imaginary component. All right, complex, um, these are complex numbers, complex conjugates, we call them. They're conjugates, right? It's this, the sign between them is different, so these are definitely conjugates, but they, they're complex numbers as well, so we call these complex conjugates. So again, foiling, so you think about four terms, so we get four times four is 16, but this outer term and this inner term are going to cancel. So we don't have to worry with those. And then it's the, the, out, the, the last two terms. So that's going to be negative 49, but I squared. So it's really going to be positive 49, right? So 16 plus 49 or 65. Okay, again, a complex number times a complex number ought to give, give us something like a complex number. But this is a purely real number. And so this is useful because notice there's no I's in our answer. So we will occasionally use this idea when we're trying to simplify uh, or get a complex number out of a denominator, which is what we're going to see here. Okay. So first thing we want to do with this kind of problem on A here is get rid of the negatives under the radical. We never want to leave negatives under radicals. So this becomes... Uh, 5 minus i square root of 5 over 3 plus i square root of 3. Okay, so we want to get rid of the i in the denominator. So we cannot leave i's in denominators because um, it's like a radical, right? It's the square root of negative 1. So no i's in denominators we would really want to get rid of that. So we, let's multiply. Um, let's multiply by, uh, wait a minute, sorry. Uh, this is not right. I'm not sure where I got that square root of three from. Uh, this is just three plus i. Yeah, the i came out. I was thinking there was a three in there. Uh, so it's three plus i. All right, so we want to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. So this is three minus i and three minus i. And you'll see now in the denominator, there won't be any i's. When I multiply complex conjugates together, the i's go away. So let's see what we have. Um, upstairs, we want to foil. So we get 15. The outer is negative 5i. And then we have a negative 3i square root of 5 for the inners. And then we have a negative times negative, that's a positive i squared square root of 5, so negative square root of 5, right? The i's, negative i times negative i, that's going to be positive i squared, but i squared is negative, so negative square root of 5. Okay, so then, um, and then on the bottom, okay, so bottom we have 9, Right? The inners are going to uh, cancel. We don't have to worry about it. And then negative i squared. But i squared, negative i squared, that should just be plus 1. All right. So now up here, uh, there's not really a perfect way to write this, but let's put the real parts out in front. So it's like 15 minus the square root of 5. And then um, that's a 5. Minus... 5i minus 3i square root of 5, I guess. So it's like the real parts here and the imaginary parts here. It kind of seems to be the best way to do that. And then the bottom is just 10. <clears throat> okay. That makes sense. And then um, let's try b. So in this case, here we had a, we had a binomial um, or, or a complex number. Here we have a complex number, but it's purely imaginary. So you might think of it as 0 minus 4i. So you might say, well, 
we could multiply that by its conjugate as well. So zero plus four i. So we wouldn't really include the zero, we would just say, oh, think about the conjugate as being four i. Now this isn't the best solution here, and I'm, I'm gonna show you this approach, and then I'll show you the, really the best way to do this. So four i over four i, right? It's negative four i, so I'm doing positive four i. So when I multiply that, 15 times four, that's what, 60i on top. On the bottom, we get a negative 16i squared. So that's just 16. So we have 60i over 16, but that reduces. There's a four in both of those. And so we can say that's 15i uh, over four. So I divided this by four and I divided this by four and got 15. Now you see I had to reduce that at the end because I didn't really need to multiply by four. When the bottom is purely imaginary, I don't need the conjugate. So let's write that again. So we have 15 over negative four i. I just multiply by the opposite sign. So it's negative four i, so I want positive i. And what's nice about that is what it gives me. i times i is i squared. That's negative 1 times the negative 4. So this is just going to jump right to 4, positive 4, and on top 15i. So you can see how much faster it was to get to our answer. Um, if the bottom is purely imaginary, don't multiply by what would sort of be the conjugate 4i. In that case, there's a special situation where you would just change the sign of the thing. That's negative. Use a positive i and a positive i. Okay. Otherwise, you'll have negatives in both of those. You'll have to cancel those out too. Okay. All right. So here is the homework. Do next class.